Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to this edition of Disability Viewpoints. My special guest host today is Nick Wilkie from the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. My special guest today is Mai Thor, who's had some uh, work with the Americans with Disabilities Act and some other issues. Going to talk to us in a little bit here on Disability Viewpoints. Nick, who is your special guest today? Mark, I'm so excited to be here with you virtually today. My special guest, um, to go along with your topic of advocacy and ADA and all kinds of experiences, my my guest is going to be Brittany Wilson. Uh, she is she is new to the uh, new to the to the um, disability scene and advocacy, and has just completed a course in partners and policy making. And she's got a lot of insights and a lot of um, good input to uh, share with our viewers. I'm really excited to have her on and just be kind of tying into your um, to your segment on advocacy and independent living and ADA accommodations. Mm -hmm. And I'm super excited that you also got my on the show as well today. I am so. too. I am too. So all that and more is just ahead on Disability Viewpoints. Please stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Disability Viewpoints. My special guest today is Mai Thor. Mai Thor has been in the disability community for a long, long time and represented us well. And of course, she's had some experiences with the ADA and other things, and so she wanted to talk to us today, and she's always welcome on the show. So today we welcome Mai Thor. Welcome back, Mai. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my first question to you today is, what has been your overall experience with the ADA and what, what kind of role has it played in your life? So I think uh, the way I, I look at how the ADA has made an impact on my life is not just as a person with a disability, um, but I think it's really had a, a real all encompassing um, overall impact or effect on how I live my life. Um, and as you know, Mark, the ADA is really um, all about um, inclusion, right? Absolutely. And making sure that folks with disabilities have the same opportunity as everyone else. And so um, that I see that impact on my life in different levels and different layers. And, um, you know, I identify as a Hmong woman with a disability. Um, so there's a lot of different like identities and intersections there, well, right? And, um, yeah, and, and let me clarify for a minute the inclusion piece. It, it includes transportation, employment, housing, everything right. that, you know, et cetera, Absolutely. et cetera. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the ADA is only 30 years old, so it's pretty young. Right, <laughs> um, right. And so I, I lived a good part of my um, more formidable years as a uh, as a young person without the ADA. You're still young. And, um, well, that's arguable, but thank you. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, I remember what it was like without the ADA. And I remember, Absolutely. you know, being to school and being told that I couldn't go to the school that I wanted to go to because it wasn't, you know, quote unquote, set up for right, me. Right. Um, I was, I remember, um, you know, being put into certain classes that weren't accessible, yeah. you know, because they were like stadium style. And, you know, I had to sit all the way in the back because I couldn't get down to the front. Again, that, that um, inclusion piece is important in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it, it, the ADA really had, uh, I, I didn't experience it until probably later on in high school because that's when it was passed. But even then, it, I think it took a long time for mm -hmm. some of those mandates in the ADA to really take effect. And so I probably didn't really actually um, experience the benefits of the ADA until I was a young adult in right. college and then even after college. Uh, and my next question is, as a, as a person with a disability, do you feel you've ever been discriminated against? If so, how? I definitely have, absolutely. And I would argue that most folks with disabilities have experienced that. And, um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, disc discrimination can be different levels, right? It could be very overt, right. like there are stairs in front of a government building and no other way to get in. That's 
plain and simple discrimination um, based on the law, right? Right. Um, and that's a violation. Right. I've definitely experienced that. Uh, maybe you have too, Mark. I'm sure um, I have. I but, know I have. But the other this kind of discrimination that I really want to talk, uh, speak to is sort of the more subtle discrimination that you wouldn't necessarily think is discrimination, but as a person with disability, you know it's discri discrimination, right. right? Because you can you can feel it. You know, it's just a bad feeling of like, okay, yeah. I, I'm being singled out. I'm, I'm being tr treated unfairly. Yep. And I think a good example of that, um, Mark, is sort of like a microaggressive discrimination that people with disabilities experience daily. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I experience it all the time. Like when I go out to dinner with my family or with friends and the waiter doesn't speak directly to you. They no. ask your companion, what would that person like? Like for dinner, and, yeah. Right. And it's like, you know, you could you can ask me directly. You know, I mean you don't have to treat me any differently no. because of disability. And it, it does happen though. It definitely happens. And so I think people with disabilities will agree that discrimination happens to them on many different levels. Well and and, and there's people who I think honestly know they're discriminating and people who don't know that they've discriminated against a person with right. disability and that we have to correct some of that the yes. the uh, the disability justice piece can you tell us how that's affected the ADA yeah I think so I think the ADA is a really great um, foundation right for which disability justice has grown from um, and you know it provides that legal blueprint of compliance for employers businesses public entities etc cetera, etc cetera, all those things that are super important to the lives of folks with disabilities but I think um, when we're talking about disability justice it's really more about a movement it's really about attitudes. It's really about inclusion on, on a whole different level that recognizes the fact that people with disabilities come from all backgrounds, um, all genders, all classes, right? I mean, we we are, folks with disabilities do not live in a vacuum. We are all different people. And I think that's really what it's all about um, when we talk about disability justice and how yeah. we want to have disability centered in conversations and policy and you know regulations and you know we just want to be recognized as the people that we are and how we can contribute to our communities and our society you know and this is uh, the last question we got a couple minutes left how do you think the ADA has affected the quality of your life you know, as a whole and what do you think can be done even better now yeah I I think it's really affected it in a really positive way. I think, I mean, obviously it's really important to have such a, a law, right, exist for us and working on our behalf, um, you know, to where we can be fully included and to where we can just go out to the movies and enjoy a show and, you know, have captioning available right. or audio description available. Right. Or, you know, you and I could go down the street and use those curb cuts, right? Absolutely. Um, that that obviously impacts us Absolutely. Greatly, uh, Absolutely. in a positive way. You know, how do you think the ADA will affect, like, the autonomous vehicles that, you know, if, if you're a disabled person, you know, you drive. I think I can say that on the air. I, I do drive, but I would love to not have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah. would love to have a car just drive me around yeah. by itself. But but the, auto yeah. the autonomous vehicles would have to have the ADA law connected to it. In other words, would have to make it so the disab disability people aren't discriminated against in any, any way, shape, or form. So when that happens, again, we need to look at the ADA and the justice piece. Right. And I think that's another way, that's another purpose of the ADA um, is that, you know, just just by the very fact that it exists, yep. it does serve as that sort of like checkpoint, right? For whatever technology develops yeah. between here, here and whatever, you know, between, you know, going forward, I guess, yeah. whatever we develop, we have to take the ADA into consideration. And I think you're a point about 
autonomous vehicles is a really good one because yeah autonomous vehicles will need to take the ada into consideration yeah, absolutely because and I, if that's something that everybody's going to be able to use in the future yep the folks with disabilities will absolutely need to benefit from that as well well that'll be across the united states and i know the state council on disabilities here is taking a good look at that and i think the ada yeah. has some inclusion what, any final thought before we go? Anything I missed? Uh, it, this time has gone by so fast. It's been so fun having you that I want to get your final word in here. Yeah, I think um, final thoughts are really just, um, you know, there is more work to do, kind of like you mentioned just now, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, the ADA turned 30 in July, right. and that's Unfor a really great milestone. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, we weren't able to celebrate it, but next year, I think they're going to have 31. That's, that is true, um, but we, we do have um, plans for the the um, the next anniversary, and hopefully right. it'll be just like a huge bash and everybody can, you know, participate in that. But I think, um, you know, we want to celebrate all that we've accomplished, right? Because yeah. um, it's not been a small feat. By, not by not at all. And I, there's been... I really appreciate you having me on. It's always great to be on and see you and talk with well, you. Well, it's it's great so to see you. you. Great to see you too. Congratulations on your new home. Good luck to the boys this school year, and it's been an honor to have you on the show, Mai. And we'll see you again soon, and and we'll talk soon. Thank you very much for being on All Disability right. Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. We'll be right back right after this with more Disability Viewpoints. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Disability Viewpoints. I'm your co-host, Nicholas Wilkie. With me today is Brittany Wilson. Uh, she's an advocate. She's tr tremendous. She's a, she's a professional. Um, and I wanted to bring her on to talk about um, a variety of things related to disability, advocacy, independent living, civil rights, all the big buzz opportunities that are happening right now virtually um this is this is my first virtual show i'm not sure if Brittany's had experience doing virtual shows before but we're gonna find out um Brittany, thanks for coming on today and thanks for being part of this experience absolutely nick thanks for having me i'm excited i have not done a virtual interview like this before so we're newbies together Awesome. Awesome. So I'm, I'm feeling all the pressure already, <laughs> but I'm very excited as well. Um, you know, along with um, telling your story a little bit, Britt, when did, when did advocacy really begin for you? Sure. So um, I was born with a disability called arthrogryposis, and I use an electric wheelchair to get around. Um, so advocacy, I like to think for me, really kind of started when I was born, you know, um, like so many other disabled people, when you are born, the doctors really gave my mom no hope for me um, and basically told her not to expect anything of me. And uh, it's really sad that that is still happening. Um, even today, because we don't know really anything about about our uh, children when they're first born, you know, and I think setting up expectations like that can be really um, harmful. But thankfully, my grandma, she told my mom, she said, you know, if you don't have any expectations for her, she's not going to have any for herself. And I think that that really set the tone for me. My mom is such a strong woman and she I, I have everything to thank for her. Uh, because she had expectations for me and she always told me, you know, you're going to go to college, you're going to work, you're going to do everything. Um, and she really made that happen for me when I was really young. So that's, I'm so awesome. that's great. That's great. It's, it's awesome how like that simple notion of those expectations kid do so much to shape, you know, who, who we become as individuals. Um, just as a follow up, this wasn't in the script, Brett, but did you ever, did you ever come up against like perceptions that 
challenge those expectations at home. So like community that thought one thing when you were already being told something else. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, throughout my life, I've had to come against expectations, barriers, shall we say, that other people have of me. I always think about that when I when I'm thinking about disability. I don't think necessarily the hardest thing about my life is being disabled. I think one of the hardest things about my life is how other people perceive my disability and how they treat me uh, or don't treat me because of that disability. Right. That. That's always the hardest part. Um, but, you know, when you have a mom at home that's yelling at you, telling you to clean your room, she doesn't care how disabled you are. Um, right. You know, that she cleans up a bit. Yep. You figure out ways to get it done. <laughs> you do. Right. Even calling your friends and making them clean your room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's move to um, what makes independent living so important to you? And then what does it mean? Sure. So kind of a little bit more background for me. Um, I have PCA services and PCAs to me have really helped me live an independent life. I was able to graduate high school. I was able to go to college um, because I had uh, care work. I was able to live on my own once I graduated high school. And um, eventually I was able to move away from where I grew up, which is St. Cloud and to now live in St. Paul. So for me, independent living is everything. Um, I always like to say that for me, I don't view independent living as a disabled person doing everything for themselves, doing everything by themselves, overcoming their obstacles. No, what I view independent living is, is I, I believe that it's about having the tools and the services that allow you to have control over your life. That to me is what independent living is. And so because I was able to have, you know, care work, I was able to be in control of my life and say, hey, this is what I need. These are the services that I need. I want to, you know, work. I want to live on my own. How can we make that happen? So I just want to stress that to me, independent living is not a linear thing. It looks different for every person. But for me, it really boils down to being, you know, able to have the choice and the say in your life. That is so that is so important. And that's like, that's so completely parallel and reinforces the, the work of the office that I work for too, Britt, because as a center for independent living, we want to give people the tools so that they can move forward and do whatever it is that they want to do when they want to do it and when it's important to them. So um, th thank you for reinforcing that. Can you describe some circumstances where, um, you know, you had initial interaction with the Americans with Disabilities Act and how that has how that has impacted your life personally, as well as what it's like to be a professional in that in that scope. Sure. I mean, the ADA was great at, at the time in, in still thinking about it now. I mean, it's a huge piece of legislation that covered so many different um, aspects of what it means to have a disability. Uh, for me personally, you know, having that law there meant that I could you know, my mom and I could challenge schools when they wanted me to go to a different one, uh, you know, full time because the high school I was meant to go to, um, you know, wasn't fully accessible. Um, professionally, it meant that I knew when I was asking for modica modifications like automatic door openers that that was covered under the ADA and that was not a reason a reasonable accommodation. Um, you know, so it really kind of helps. Um, provide a bit of a backbone, I guess, you know, to the things, the services that we need um, to be in included in society. But with that being said, I feel like we have so much further to go and I don't feel satisfied with the ADA as it is today. Um, you know, one example that I have is, I think it's a real travesty that I think there's there's this view that you, you almost have to sue businesses for them to make, you know, the place accessible and that to me just sets the wrong tone you know it, it and I don't I don't like that so for me I really believe that we need to see more accountability we need to see people 
you know, be taking the ADA seriously. Um, but coming from a place of we want the disabled community to be a part of the community and not based off of oh us being fearful that we're just going to get sued you know i think it, it there has to be kind of that paradigm shift that there's a reason the ada is in place and it's to give um you know access and community to a whole group of of people um and also just the fact that disability is natural and that you know everyone's going to be disabled at some point in their life like this is um this is huge and it's a big deal yeah um i i totally identify with uh a number of things that you've said brett and i always like to say that like making making something more accessible using techniques around universal design yes it makes it easier for everybody you know, so it's not just a curb cut. It's not just a doorknob. It's it's making things easier for every single person out there. And I totally reinforce what you're saying about everybody, everybody becoming um, somebody that needs accommodations eventually. And I think a further challenge is getting all the quote unquote people that don't have diagnosed disabilities, but attain disabilities later in life, getting those individuals to acknowledge that it's okay. They're gonna need some help. They're gonna need better access. Right. And disability isn't a bad thing, right? It's not a bad word. It's not, I mean, it's a part of life. But also if I could say too, Nick, one really yeah. important thing that Corona has taught the rest of the world that I feel disabled people have always known is that yes, accommodations can be made, you know? Um, suddenly millions of people are working from home. Yeah. Suddenly all these different events are being broadcasted uh, via yeah. Zoom, you know, doctor's appointments. These are things that people with disabilities, as you know, have been asking for for a really long time and it's not really hard to do. So, um what uh, what are you looking forward to when it comes to um, civil rights for people with disabilities, especially um, people of color with disabilities? Sure. Uh, you know, that's a really big question. Yeah. There's a lot of different things yeah. I want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, disability rights is kind of the, the, the last big civil rights movement that I feel just hasn't gained the attention that it should. And it's really sad to me because disability, as we know, it doesn't discriminate. Um, as far as what I'm looking forward to with people of color, I think it's our time to be leading this movement. I think that when it comes to things like police brutality, we already know that 30 to 50 percent of those that die in police custody have some sort of disability that's big. Um, so for me, it's time for us to have people at the intersections, people of color, you know, um, part of the queer community, uh, indigenous, things like that. Th these people are the ones that I feel need to be leading the movement. I think historically we've seen, um, you know, white, white disabled men be the voices of our community, um, but I don't feel that it's representative. And so for me, in order for us to move forward, we need to include a lot more voices. We need to address the, the racism in the disability community because it's definitely there. Um, and the more marginal someone is I think the more at the forefront that they need to be um, so that those are some of the biggest things that I feel awesome and the, and all all of those all of those points Britt like we could like we could break each one of those down and just be like okay expand on this one and that one and that one and that one it's so important um did you have um did you have any any other things that you wanted to mention that I that I didn't um, kind of give you room to do within the questions that I sent you? Sure. I guess for anyone watching this, you know, my advocacy journey was a lot about me for most of my life and getting the services that I needed and trying to find a way to, you know, overcome, or I even hate overcome, but challenge the barriers. That's better. Challenge the barriers in my life. Um, 
But one thing that really changed my life most recently was partners in policymaking. I'm sure you've had people on the show that have taken um, this advocacy course, but it's for people with disabilities and for um, parents who have children that have developmental disabilities. And that program really changed my life. So one thing I really want to touch on is that advocacy and finding your voice are so important. If you're looking for a great resource and you have a disability, uh, partners in policymaking is definitely something that you should check out. Is it still run by government training services, Britt? It is run by the Governor's Council. Okay. What has been the best thing about your about your quarantine experience and what has been the hardest thing? You know, um, I think the best thing for me it has been to be able to slow down a little bit. Um, I think that as people with disabilities in general, um, we're, we're probably more prone and used to um, being isolated, being in our homes and stuff. And so that part wasn't as hard for me. But I think that like kind of slowing down and, and thinking more about how I can use this time um, you know, reconnecting with family and stuff, that's been probably the best. I think one of the hardest things though has been um, not being able to access the services that I am used to in the same way that I was used to. Um, really kind of fearful that COVID could turn could turn back a lot of the rights that we've gained as, as people with disabilities. Um, just seeing that in, with kids doing distant learning and and just a lot of things, you know, it, it's been hard to see, to see that. Um, so, yeah. Brett, I want to, I want to thank you for spending the time to come on and not only tell us a little bit more about you, but also, also illustrate some great points um, to make another great segment for Disability Viewpoints. Um, would you be, would you be interested in coming on again in a virtual <laughs> format? Any time, any time. Any time. Once we, uh, once we can get back in the studio, I would love to have you again. That would be great, Nick. I would love that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll tune in for Disability Viewpoints back in a few moments. That's going to do it for this edition of Disability Viewpoints. I'd like to thank Nick Wilkie from the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living and Mai Thor, who has been my special guest and a real advocate in the disability community for her work on the ADA and some other uh, issues that she's had. I, we could have gone on with that interview for another 20 minutes or so, and uh, she's just done some great things, and I'm honored to know her and have her on the show. And Nick, your guest was, uh, Brittany was equally as, as good and thank her for being on here. I kind of felt that Britt and I could have kept that conversation going for a while. Um, we are just in a spot of um, expansion and awareness and, you know, further in the mission of why we do the show, Mark. And we want to remind, remind everybody before we go that in January of 2021, our session will start again in the House and the Legislature. And we probably will have Community Tuesday, so stay tuned for those announcements, which will be coming up uh, in the not-too-distant future. Again, I'm Mark Hughes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Disability Viewpoints. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody.